All right, it's time. Welcome to the briefing lawsuit challenges, U.S. aid to Israel and nuclear gag order. My name is Grant Smith. I'm the founder and research director of IRMEP, the Institute for Research, Middle Eastern Policy here in Washington. Just a quick note, this conference call will be recorded. I'm using some visual aids. Those of you who checked your email inboxes have the option of either clicking a link, opening a web browser, and following along using that to see the slides in sync with the discussion. And there's also a link to a PDF copy of all of the slides that you can download and page through as well. We're going to be having a question and answer session at the end. Uh, you'll hear an announcement when the queue opens for that. So think about your questions and be ready for that as soon as we get through the main presentation. The Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy is a Washington-based nonprofit organization that studies U.S. Middle East policy formulation. Founded in 2002, we became an independent, private, nonprofit tax-exempt organization in 2003. We're nonpartisan. We don't support or oppose candidates for public office. Some of our main program areas include the Israel Lobby Archive, which is a repository for documents about the history and little-known initiatives uh, providing citizen access to relevant documents about the behind-the-scenes activities of one of the most little-studied forces driving policy formulation in the U.S. political po process, which is the Israel Lobby. Our conferences are public events, often held in partnership with other organizations or sometimes solely organized by us that provide timely insights of experts and opportunities to network with Americans concerned about U.S. Middle East policy and how it's made. I have a small announcement for one of those conferences at the very end. IRMEP polling is the newest program. Those are periodic single question polls to representative samples, mostly in the United States, asking key questions about US policy with very fast turnaround. Our research and analysis appears in online publications, news releases, email updates, select social media platforms, uh, and often in such places as the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs or antiwar.com online. Our program of interest today is the Center for Policy and Law, which files Freedom of Information Act requests and lawsuits to create warranted transparency and reveal hidden functions of government. And we also examine how balanced and vigorous law enforcement, as well as civil suits filed by private individuals, can improve human rights, trade, economic development, and America's international standing. Now, the context for the lawsuit that we're going to be focusing on today, and we filed it over a year ago, uh, has changed quite dramatically. When we filed our lawsuit challenging U.S. aid to Israel over its nuclear weapons programs, we were in an entirely different environment than today. Uh, essentially, the change of administrations has caused that. The Trump administration is as committed, however, to keeping the subject of Israel's nuclear weapons off the table as any previous administration, but they are unlike uh, any previous administration in their declared intention uh, to side 100% with Israel and its lobby over questions such as moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, unwillingness to reprimand Israeli settlements, uh, having a Middle East peace team more tilted to Israel than any previous, uh, and which has proven to be highly responsive to Israel lobbying initiatives in the United States. Uh, so essentially we have an environment 
uh, that's very different than the Obama administration environment, which uh, in which uh, also the Israel lobby is attempting to criminalize boycotts of Israel, get the U.S. more strongly engaged against Iran and Syria. In contrast, uh, the Obama administration in its final days actually abstained from a UN vote condemning settlements. Uh, it was the architect of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, that briefly took the question of Iran's nuclear program off the table. And we as an organization played a small role at a very key moment during the JCPOA debate when we obtained a court-ordered release of a 1987 report about Israel's nuclear weapons infrastructure. And you'll see if you're following along through the web browser or slide deck page number four that the name of that release was Critical Technology Assessment in Israel and NATO Nations, a 1987 report that was conducted for the Under Secretary of Defense at the DOD. Now, why was this important? Well, it came just before Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's address to Congress, attempting to derail the JCPOA, and the release of the report suddenly put the taboo subject of Israel's nuclear weapons program on the table, generating howls of outrage from neoconservative and Israel lobby type pundits. And they accused the Obama administration of, I guess, working through IRMEP, of all places, weakening Israel's deterrent capabilities in a ploy to pass the JCPOA. They chided mainstream media for even publishing stories about the facts in the report, again called Critical Technology Assessment in Israel and NATO Nations. But most of this reporting, particularly the most enraged reporting, was full of errors, the biggest being that the report was classified. Uh, it was not a classified report. One of the reporters who thought to contact us about the report from Barron's quickly calmed many people down by stating correctly that the Obama administration had no intention or role in aiding the report's release and that it was not even classified. So one of the handful of reporters again uh, who contacted us about the years of efforts, both administratively through the Freedom of Information Act and uh, the legal effort in the courtroom with multiple appearances before the judge, the effort it took to obtain release of the report, Jim McTeague from Barron's calmed everybody down, stated correctly that the Obama administration uh, was in fact uh, not really playing any role. In reality, the release of the report was due entirely to one judge. One judge alone in the DC District Court was the person who made it possible for that report talking about Israel's nuclear weapons infrastructure and even program work on a hydrogen bomb that that report saw the light of day. The Obama administration was adverse to dealing publicly with Israel's nuclear weapons and the policy implications of Israel's nuclear weapons program as any of his predecessors. In fact, his administration was worse. It dodged and weaved whenever questions such as by the late Helen Thomas were pointed uh, in the direction of what is the current Israeli nuclear posture in the region when he was in office. His administration was also worse than any of the previous Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, too, and so forth, because he implemented a legislative rule with the power of law mandating that the subject was entirely off limits across all government agencies. So, 
The bottom line is that a successful long-term effort to expose such dangerous policies can have an extremely beneficial impact. There is no avenue, like the legal avenue, to make it happen. The core objective of all of our lawsuits is to use the court system to improve transparency and rule of law. In fact, the use of classification to keep information away from the American public was supposed to be forbidden by an executive order passed in 2009, forbidding the classification, uh, secrecy classification as a cover-up for wrongdoing. So it is our view that the executive order had to address that since it is so obviously the reason so much information, particularly 25, 50 years and older is still classified. And so we hope that our lawsuits uh, serve as an inspiration for others to get active in this realm. Uh, there is uh, so much potential and so much possibility in the court system. Now, talking a little bit about some of our past and present lawsuits, our first lawsuit, the one I mentioned, filed in 2014, number 01611, had a major impact on the JCPOA debate in that it was perceived, perceived as a threat by the US to ditch nuclear ambiguity and come more clean about the Israeli nuclear weapons program. Our second lawsuit, 150024, filed in 2015, sought CIA operational files over the 1960s diversion of weapons grade uranium from the United States to Israel. The judge was unconvinced that our lawsuit met all of the strict CIA Information Act of 1985 requirements to actually get the release of tightly held classified information, numbering in the thousands of documents. We had to make a decision whether or not to appeal, but we ultimately decided not to appeal. The effort did result in the release of information never before seen by the American public sufficient to know that the CIA withheld crucial information from the FBI about the diversion. Another lawsuit filed in 2015, 01431, is fighting for access of the top line secret intelligence aid that the United States gives to Israel above and beyond and not even counted in the publicly available foreign aid numbers. And finally, the lawsuit that we've Appealed this year, 1601610, which was filed in 2016, just as the 10-year foreign aid package worth $38 billion to Israel is being finalized. Uh, there's a policy and legal linkage between U.S. foreign aid and Israel's nuclear weapons program, which we wish to explore. Israel clearly has a nuclear weapons program but has never signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. There's a, an abundant amount of public domain information about it. And after they left office, both President Jimmy Carter and Secretary of State Colin Powell confirmed that Israel had more than 150 nuclear weapons. But what are the details? Nobody outside of government knows what the U.S. posture toward this nuclear state is. Seymour Hersh wrote in his 1991 book, The Samson Option, that Israel will destroy the world if it ever faces an existential threat. This year, Professor Noam Chomsky, uh, who's not always reliable on many Middle East issues, but he speculated that Israel would use nuclear weapons if Palestinian refugees were ever uh, to receive any serious support for a return. So, the bottom line is, you can't get any information about the nuclear posture toward Israel. Those who talk don't know, and those who don't, those who do know, don't talk. But there are some hints. Acting Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs Susan Thornton may have provided a clue on September 12 of this year when she told Congress what the posture towards North Korea was, and that was 
that the U.S. does not officially recognize North Korea's nuclear power, but it does fear nuclear blackmail by North Korea. Uh, I think that if Israel is leveraging its nuclear arsenal as a hammer to extract foreign aid and U.S. diplomatic support, that the U.S. public should know about it. Obviously, the Israelis, their lobby and policymakers who've gone along with this would not want that to be out for debate. But the question remains, how can the U.S. give foreign aid to Israel when there are special procedures for that under the Arms Export Control Act? It's impossible to get an answer to this question. Policymakers, when they're in office, they run from this question. It's impossible to get a straight answer. Working directly with the executive branch or Congress, there's just no way to do it. So getting answers from those or to those questions, which could then lead to accountability through the courts, is what our lawsuit's all about. But make, make no mistake, this is a serious attempt also, not only to overturn nuclear ambiguity, but to block foreign aid. And Americans support this. The core claim in the lawsuit is that the Symington and Glenn Amendments to the U.S. Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 are being violated. These laws prohibit U.S. aid to any non-nuclear, non-proliferation treaty signatory that is building up a nuclear weapons program, transferring technologies from other countries, and transferring related technologies to other countries. The Symington and Glenn Amendments specifically require the U.S. president to either stop giving aid or issue waivers that explain why it is in the U.S. national interest to continue delivering such aid. Some of the exact language <clears throat> is on the following slide. But the legislative intent is clear. And though amended, it is still on the books. Said Stuart Symington, if you wish to take the dangerous and costly steps necessary to achieve a nuclear weapons option, you cannot expect the United States to help underwrite that effort directly or indirectly. And the specific statute, 22 U.S.C. 2799-AA1, covers all of that. It's in the Arms Export Control Act. In a recent poll, when asked, Israel and its U.S. lobby want Congress to finance Israel's qualitative military edge over rivals without considering Israel as the region's sole nuclear power, 52% of Americans said that Israel's nuclear weapons should be factored in. And there's a link to those polls, statistically significant polls, I might add, at the very end of this presentation. The U.S. provides more foreign aid to Israel than any other country. Our research tells us the reason for that is because of the Israel lobby's dominance in financing political campaigns, not due to any U.S. strategic or security concern. And as we enter a new round of one-sided arguments over Iran and nuclear weapons, it is more important than ever to discuss aid in the context of Israel's nuclear weapons, aid since Symington and Glenn was implemented in particular. And so why haven't concerned Americans ever attempted to stop foreign aid to Israel? Well, actually, they have. Fagan Dixon, a Harvard lawyer from Texas, who is an anti-war activist behind a campaign to bring Lyndon Johnson home, and rather than having a second term, uh, did sue under the establishment cause of the First Amendment to the Constitution, trying to stop U.S. foreign aid to Israel on the, on the grounds that it was violating uh, separation of church and state, and he lost. Somebody more people have heard of, science fiction author Isaac Asimov and other plaintiffs, sued to stop U.S. AID funding to religious schools, including Israel, over the establishment clause. And they also lost. Starting to see a pattern? This year, another Texan, Joe Poole Jr., three-time Republican candidate for the Texas Supreme Court. Foreign aid to Afghanistan, says Poole, in a lawsuit filed August of this year, uh, supports or amounts to illegal support for Muslim nations, says Joe Poole. 
He sued to stop it, arguing, like others, that it violates the what? Establishment Clause. Although it's still in court, all the legal experts weighing in on it say that it's a grievance that's too generalized. So the lessons are clear. Establishment Clause challenges to U.S. foreign aid have not prevailed. And so the question is, well, what could work? What could work? The most successful recent lawsuit challenging a president, challenging foreign agencies on overreach, not following the rule of law, inventing law out of whole cloth, was over deferred access for childhood arrivals, otherwise known as DACA. States sued President Obama and prevailed over harm alleged by unlawful legislative rules, having the force of law, issued over undocumented immigrants, and failure to follow, hence, administrative procedure. We don't take any position on any aspect of DACA. To say it in the trite, overused Washington cliche way, that's not in our wheelhouse. However, the DACA lawsuit is the model for our foreign aid lawsuit. If you examine DACA and our litigation, you find that regulations issued and enforced by federal agencies to implement policy rather than regulations based on amnesty or immigration laws passed by Congress including driver's license issuance, schooling, welfare programs for non-citizens, etc., formed the basis for the cause for the DACA litigation. The harm was unfunded costs incurred by states over DACA mandates. And so, first by seeking and winning an injunction against the executive orders implementing DACA, and then keeping their lawsuit alive until the Trump administration came to power, the litigants were able to successfully challenge a policy that looked uh, quite strong. The end game was obviously the entry of the Trump administration, the litigants ended their action. If you examine our lawsuit targeting foreign aid and nuclear ambiguity, you don't see the establishment clause. You see the Obama administration, passing legislative laws on nuclear ambiguity, inflicting unreimbursed costs under the uh, auspices of WPN 136. And you see a party, in this case, a nonprofit research group, trying to get some accountability. Outcome to be determined. In the lower courts, where our lawsuit has already passed, when it was known as 1601610, the argument was that the president and federal agencies created a legislative rule that is, rather than getting something from Congress, they invented it in order to deny access to government information about Israel's nuclear weapons program. They blocked information to preserve a policy called nuclear ambiguity and official recognition about Israel's nuclear weapons program as a means to continue delivering foreign aid without observing Arms Export Control Act provisions. It was codified, if you want to say, that, say it that way, in an unlawful legislative rule called WPN 136. Now, people uh, have been researching nuclear ambiguity in particular in the context of a famous Nixon administration agreement with Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, in which they promised as long as Israel didn't talk about its possession of nuclear weapons by declaring them or testing them, the U.S. would tolerate and shield it. Recently declassified Nixon administration files reveal fears of a, quote, Zionist campaign to try to undermine, unquote, the president was a major factor in promising to do this. Nothing about U.S. national interests there. But there are still hundreds of unreleased Nixon administration files on this topic. I don't think we've heard the last word about it. Some files uh, have been pried out, but uh, more needs to come out. 
Anyway, the impetus that started with Nixon has continued, except that in 1976, presidents are supposed to begin acting about what they know, as opposed to simply what they promised the Israelis. So details about how and why nuclear ambiguity policy was made by the Nixon administration continues to be one of the most tightly held secrets at the Nixon Presidential Library in Yorba Linda, California. And if you look at the finding aids of the National Security Study Memorandums, you'll see that only one, number 40, uh, is so classified that the title hasn't even been released. And all of these study documents answering the questions about what to do about Israel's re uh, nuclear weapons are still classified and being withheld at the Nixon Library. So WPN 136 is a gag order on the release of information or official discussion of the Israeli nuclear weapons program by US government agency employees or contractors, their penalties for reprimand, the penalties include reprimand, job loss, uh, imprisonment. The impact has been that the flow of information has now all but stopped. WPN 136 supersedes and undermines two sunshine laws, the Freedom of Information Act, mandatory declassification re reviews. It keeps out of reach not only the Nixon Kissinger files, but other National Security Council and strategy files on Israeli proliferation, what to do about the Samson option, uh, BIS files on Israeli nuclear technology smuggling, which is ongoing, etc., uh, etc. Et so, Bureau of Industry and Security files in particular, uh, will mention this, are particularly difficult to get, and these show ongoing proliferation by the Israelis. So, just as states were harmed by DACA mandates, researchers are similarly harmed every day by WPN 136, that is, those who actually seek these types of files. WPN 136 is illegitimate. It was derived from a U.S. State Department classification guideline that encourages openness and reporting and treating as unclassified information that is already in the public domain. Uh, it has an Orwellian title, Guidance on Release of Information Relating to the Potential for an Israeli Nuclear Capability. All sorts of conditionals in there. But it has teeth. It acts as a deterrent. Ask James Doyle, a Los Alamos National Laboratory nuclear analyst who wrote a forthright article called Why Eliminate Nuclear Weapons in 2013? in which he said, nuclear weapons did not deter Egypt and Syria from attacking Israel in 1973, and admission, a statement that the Israelis have nuclear weapons. Curiously enough, a congressional staffer read the article, raised a fuss. It was referred to a second classification review. Doyle's pay was then cut, his home computer was searched, and he was fired. So our complaint in the lower court, August 8, 2016, uh, was going after all of this. It was dismiss dismissed on standing. And the interesting thing, obviously, since we didn't use the establishment clause, it, are the straws which were grasped to get this out of the lower court, citing an entirely brand new precedent and so, of course, we appealed it, and it's now known as 1750-91 in the Court of Appeals. The defendants in alphabetical order by last name went from John Brennan of the CNA, <coughs> excuse me, CNA, uh, CIA, to Penny Pritzker of the Department of Commerce. Now that the administrations have changed, of course, the names of the defendants have changed, but they're essentially sued over role as opposed to personality. And the statutes, again, are violations of administrative procedure, that something with the force of rule of law has been diffused throughout the government with no due process. The Take Care Clause, U.S. Code uh, 281361. We're not seeking financial compensation, although that's recently been offered to make the lawsuit go away. We're not seeking files that have been withheld 
This is a challenge of the system that systematically causes injury. Some of the standing that we have that previous lawsuits against foreign aid didn't are actual dollar figure amounts. Department of Commerce demanded almost $7,000 for files detailing Israeli front company nuclear weapons technology smuggling as a clear attempt to uh, force us not to get the files. Non-payment of $624.78, retaliatory non-payment of court costs. $10,952.78 to pursue that unclassified DOD report, which had no business being uh, retained from the American public since 1987. Informational injury caused by ambiguity and undermining across the board Sunshine Law requests, including mandatory declassification reviews, and that's important. So the harm is fairly traceable to this scheme to violate the Arms Export Control Act in Symington and Glenn. They desire to ignore the AECA. They want to give Israel foreign aid. They implemented nuclear ambiguity to restrict release of government information about the program. They enforce nuclear ambiguity through WPN 136 to thwart information releases. They improperly classify, cover up, delay through the spurious use of these FOIA exemptions and denials and ex excessive bureaucracy, they implement this gag order. So what happened to our lawsuit in lower court? We filed a request for injunction, just like the DACA people did, except this time we filed for injunction against disbursement of US aid to Israel until litigation was resolved. We went up to up the cause chain of causation all the way to the the very reason nuclear ambiguity exists. The defendant sought dismissal on grounds of standing in December, and the lower court dismissed us on standing, citing a precedent that wasn't even available until long after the last brief was filed in the case on January 31, 2017. And in their haste to get rid of the lawsuit and its request for an injunction, they made numerous major errors in their seven-page decision, which provided multiple grounds for appeal. And so the new case is now called 175091. We still want an injunction against further USAID until this, the case is decided, and we tried to get that, but it was denied in May. We asked them to review WPN 136 in camera but they denied that in June since their only role is to see if his mistakes or errors were made in the decision of the lower court. We asked them to disallow a request for a lengthy extension requested by the Justice Department, uh, but that was denied in September. So we haven't been doing too well on some of the trivial issues of the lawsuit, but we have a strong argument. The lower court misapplied their precedent, which was Crew versus the Justice Department, issued a newly minted precedent in January, which said that to the extent that plaintiffs suffer informational injury, harm relating to inability to access information, based on EO 13526, which is all about classification, we got to seek redress under FOIA, not the Administrative Procedures Act. We argued that the gag order is an unlawful legislative rule that nullifies FOIA and we just can't reach it on a case-by-case -case basis through our many Freedom of Information Act cases. You can try, but you can't get there. Our appeal argument number two, the lower court asserted, well, the plaintiff may seek compensation for his FOIA fees in the lawsuit he brought pursuant to FOIA, and that's relating to the financial harm that we alleged, but they're wrong because we're not lawyers. We're just pro se litigants. And we're uniquely ineligible to receive any fees, particularly attorney fees in FOIA lawsuits. Only costs, sometimes not even that. So court filing fees, maybe. But attorney fees, only members of the bar can get those. Uh, so this is a level of lower court error which should easily trigger a remand. And then number three, 
you know, lower court argued, to the extent that the plaintiff alleges an informational injury, harm resulting from his inability to access the information he seeks based on EO 13.526, he must seek redress under FOIA, not the APA. Well, and I know I'm kind of repeating this, we also included mandatory declassification review cases, like for some of those Nixon administration files, uh, for some energy department files. And no mandatory declassification review can be appealed to any court. They can only go to a federal agency controlled board called the ICE gap. Uh, and so they're wrong. And again, this level of mistake in a lower court should easily trigger a remand. Now, there are about five other major mistakes that you can read about in our appellant brief that was filed. And that's also in a link at the very end. So what are our next moves? Well, after getting their lengthy delay, the Justice Department will be filing their appellee brief on November 8, 2017. Uh, we will get to file a reply brief, not on November 1, but somewhat later, final briefs 11-22-2017, and a decision will be made on whether to remand this to the lower courts so that the merits can finally be addressed or obviously they could rubber stamp everything and say no nope, dismissed you have just like the establishment clause parties no standing but uh, we're still asking for major relief what are we asking for do we want the judge to review a raft of sunshine law cases no do we want all the money we spent back no do we want uh, the Department of Defense to pay us what it owes us? No. As the complaint concludes, we want WPN-136 to be thrown out, and we want nuclear ambiguity to be overturned. We want Americans to be able to approach government, ask a straight question, and get a straight answer. Now, speaking of some of the obstacles to going after this kind of information, and now I'm speaking about a few different lawsuits and our experience over the past few years, uh, this is not an easy venue. It's not Congress, it's not asking the president to question, but it's still not easy. Defendant tactics uh, and judicial deference from all of the cases we have filed have been extremely interesting. Uh, Probably the most common is delay, postpone, request more time. And we've learned that the Justice Department doesn't even really have to file a request on time. It could be timely, it could be not timely. Like just last week in a Treasury Department lawsuit, on the day an answer was due, the uh, Department of Justice asked for more time. And two days later, the judge granted their motion. So in all of IRMEP's cases, IRMEP's cases, the DOJ has filed routine requests for extensions of time. Uh, the DOD nuke case, nuke report case, they requested time. CIA files on diversion of weapon-grade uranium, more time. So although extensions are supposed to only be granted for good cause, the Justice Department invariably asks for more time. And this runs down the clock. And it can, in extreme cases, allow for adjustments to be made to U.S. law and other things that really shouldn't happen when we're supposed to get quick review of such things. Uh, another thing I call the impersistence of memory. Judges in CIA cases in particular will not consider the argument that the CIA has previously incinerated and deleted information that it was ordered to release. Uh, last week, some of you may have read the headline that the CIA apologized for deleting the only copy of a 7,000-page report on torture techniques, including waterboarding and sleep deprivation. Uh, so, in another case, it was burning CIA tapes uh, on torture, that were specifically, they had specifically been ordered to release by a court. So we can't really do anything with that because when the CIA goes to court opposing FOIA release, they have a fresh clean slate with no priors. 
And it doesn't really matter what happened in other courts. Uh, they keep that reputation. In our lawsuit to get the CIA's Israel intelligence support budget, the CIA claimed it could issue a GLOMAR or a non-response because such numbers, top line budget numbers, could be held by any one of 16 intelligence agencies. And so this tactic uh, pretty much forced us to ask the other 16 intelligence agencies under FOIA. And they all, except for the uh, one, said they would not have such numbers. And some even forwarded our request to the CIA, which must have made them uh, chuckle. So now it's pivoting to other reasons not to release a budget. It's abandoning this always empty argument, this shell game. In other cases, such as the DOD case, they told us that there were non-disclosure agreements with the contractors who writ wrote part of the report that had been executed, but there weren't any. Then they told us the Israeli government had to be consulted before they could release information uh, for a U.S. unclassified taxpayer-funded report. That wasn't true. But it doesn't matter. The courts allow Justice Department lawyers to make such claims, to pivot, to play shell games. And when they all fall apart, they simply pivot to other arguments. No hard feelings. Multiple bites of the apple. There are frequent changes in DOJ representation. Uh, see what we talked about in terms of delay. But the thing that's the most troubling is multiple bites of the apple. The defendants are essentially allowed to make substantially similar arguments over and over and over again, appealing to authority uh, with the same arguments and the case stays in court and it just keeps being Groundhog Day over and over and over again. DOJ lawyers in court are infallible. There is in many senses, DOJ attorney infallibility. They can file boilerplate briefs. They can misname the parties. They can put in incorrect uh, case numbers, and they have. But this has never generated, in our experience, any reprimand or in any way changed the court's opinion of the defendants. They just keep going. Or maybe they change attorneys. So judicial, excuse me, DOJ infallibility, it's a thing. Also, something else we learned, indisputably authentic, but leaked, that is, think WikiLeaks, non-officially declassified or released U.S. government documents, don't hold any weight in court. They often are the best evidence that a defendant uh, is making false arguments. Uh, but while we can, for example, in the case of the CIA budget, they say if they tell us how much intelligence aid is being given to Israel, it would jeopardize human intelligence and their agents, since that's always the majority of its expenditures. Well, we can point out that Iran-Contra involved a lot of cash and weapons movement, but we can't use far more recent or officially released information that directly refute CIA assertions if they came out of WikiLeaks. They don't like that. They get mad, and the courts... Won't consider it. File about uh, Iran-Contra if you want, or even older, but you can't use recent verified uh, leaked information to go into court. So, this is where we are. Uh, and I want to mention just a little bit more before we go to Q&A about CIA intelligence aid to Israel our court case 1501-431, seeking top-line budget numbers. Uh, this case has been in the system a while. It's basically uh, all balanced upon a statement that President Obama made at American University in uh, August of 2015. He said to the group of assembled students, but the fact is, partly due to American military and intelligence assistance, which my administration has provided at unprecedented levels, Israel can defend itself against any conventional danger, whether from Iran directly or from its proxies. So if foreign aid is known, but that the totals were at unprecedented levels, did that mean that intelligence aid, which was secret, was $1.9 Or did he adjust for inflation and it's an additional $13.2 billion? 
This is the question we asked the CIA, and when they didn't answer, filed a lawsuit. So we're trying to get that number. We're trying to better understand whether the amounts of aid being given to Israel that the public knows about are only a fraction of the actual total. Uh, in September last month, we filed our latest lawsuit which is a better an understanding, an effort to better understand the Treasury Department and the actions and inactions of this part of government. The Treasury and other lawsuits in the pipeline start with basic questions such as, who works there? What are the priorities of the individuals? How are political appointees and long-term employees using discretion over some law enforcement advancing their own programs while other laws are neglected or suppressed. And you might think that knowing who is working in a given division is information that's easy to obtain, but if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Sometimes it's easy to obtain. For example, a Freedom of Information Act request with the Department of Justice saying, who works in the pardon attorney's office? You know that office that's supposed to present good cases for presidential pardons to be signed off by the president? Well, within a matter of 16 days, uh, the Justice Department released a list of the people who work there. And that's the way it's supposed to work. They're happy to tell you who works there. Well, no, they're happy to tell you who works there, but there are 37 separate FOIA components of the Justice Department. And others aren't so happy to tell you who works there. Uh, the Treasury Department's a whole different story. The Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence at the U.S. Treasury Department is not happy to reveal who works there. Maybe that's because it's been headed up by a series of political appointees favored by the Israel lobby, which in fact lobbied to create it. So who are the 400 individuals who work there? This unit with the primary program of going after the economies of countries that Israel considers to be rivals. Headed up by Stuart Levy, David Cohen, and most recently Sigal Mandelker. Well, it's our theory that such divisions have been captured by the lobbies that urge their creation and work to appoint highly compromised individuals to lead them. So after five years of trying to get information and getting back what you see on slide 55, paint roller redactions of lists of who works there, uh, we've decided to go to court for the information. And Treasury is at the junction of foreign aid to Israel, it's at the junction of U.S. donors and programs in Israel, such as the Wiseman Institute for Science and Technology that have been working in Israel's nuclear weapons development program, but yet receive hundreds of millions of dollars per year in tax-exempt contributions from U.S. donors. It's an extremely interesting place in terms of U.S. Middle East policy, and yet it's essentially dark. So, with that, I think we should move to questions and answers. So, I'm going to take a moment here to see if we can go from lecture mode to Q&A. Now, if you'd like to ask a question, you simply need to press the right command and I'll see that you're in the queue. I did get a question by email, which I'm gonna jump to. Well, you get your thoughts together and let's see if I can find it here. Okay, here it is. Uh, let's see. The question was, are there any other countries beside Israel that have nuclear ambiguity 
as a policy? And that's a great question. I'm not aware of any. I know that uh, one of the core strategic doctrines of having nuclear weapons is you tell everybody under no uncertain terms you have them. And then major countries like the U.S. and Russia know that if one attacks the other, that the other could be attacked as well. Mutually assured destruction. The idea that one country is keeping its weapons a secret uh, is something that is not as well known and certainly could be better known. So I have one more question here. And it said, I read the appellant brief and noticed that it mentioned the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. How is it that a lawsuit over nuclear ambiguity and foreign aid is mentioning a lawsuit, a prior lawsuit involving APAC as a precedent? Well, I can explain that. Back in the mid-1980s, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee encouraged the creation of a group of political action committees that would donate uh, to candidates that would favor a strongly pro-Israel policy in the United States. And so uh, one of the problems is that a memo from an APAC official directing dollar amounts of contributions from particular political action committees leaked to the Washington Post and a group of plaintiffs um, sued the American Israel Public Affairs Committee saying, look, you're acting like a political action committee, so your donors should obviously be public information. Just like PACs have to reveal who's donating to them and the amounts, you, APAC, which is directing PACs, should also be releasing your information. Um, and so this was a informational injury case that went to the Supreme Court. James Aitkins, a former ambassador, uh, was one of the plaintiffs. And so the case is known as Federal Elections Committee v. Aikens. And what happened was the uh, opponents, the opposition, tried to argue that there had been no harm to the group of plaintiffs, but uh, as, as voters, and that the FEC for not regulating APAC as a political action committee uh, had no fault. But the court concluded differently. They said, find it here. We conclude that informational injury at issue here directly related to voting, the most basic of political rights, is sufficiently concrete and specific that the fact that it is widely shared does not deprive Congress of constitutional power to authorize its vindication in federal courts. So the courts, uh, although ultimately they didn't prevail, the courts said that they did have standing, which is what we're fighting for right now, is standing. Oh, no, oh, I see one question popped up. Let's see if I can get, uh, get you up on the line. Please ask your question. Hello? Uh, yes, Grant, um, Jeff Blankford here. One of the things that, that seems so difficult is to get people and organizations who support the Palestinian struggle and are critical of Israel's policies to even talk about these lawsuits to, to and really go after the money. And uh, what do you think could be done about that? Yeah, uh, great question. I think a lot of the action 
is certainly um, being conducted by by groups that have made their arguments uh, based on Palestinian rights, and they don't uh, necessarily get much information about this aspect. Um, I don't uh, know that these cases, which are so firmly grounded in U.S. taxpayer rights and sort of corruption in foreign aid, uh, clearly they, they harm their cause, clearly they have an impact uh, in terms of coercive power alone, but, um, you know, although we frequently interact with and announce this sort of thing, uh, it's just not as much, uh, again, in their wheelhouse as, as it is uh, in, in other groups. So, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough question. Did you have a follow-up to that? Uh, if I could, could you hear me? Yeah, you're still on. Yeah. Uh, this would seem, however, to have more of appeal uh, to American voters, particularly who don't necessarily have a uh, a horse in, in the race. You don't really care about the outcome of the Israel-Palestine conflict, but they do care about this country and where their money goes and. Um, most people don't like to be used or would, would, would like not like to know would like to know if their politician, their member of Congress, is putting the interest of a foreign country before their constituents. Right. Their constituents. Right. And I think I mean you've you've obviously written a lot about that. I'm sure the other uh, participants in this call have know your name and, and know some of the incredible articles you've written. Uh, talking about things like Friends of the IDF and these other organizations which go under the radar, but once you tell people, hey, they're raising money in the U.S. for foreign military, hey, they're diverting young kids to serve in the IDF rather than you know, serving in the U.S. military, then it becomes uh, an issue that U.S. voters can certainly get their hands around. Uh, okay, it's eight o'clock, so uh, we're gonna wrap we're gonna wrap things up here. I just wanted to call attention to some of the resources in the back of the deck, page fifty-seven. Uh, you can see our appellate brief that was filed uh, to get this case going again. Uh, you can see examples in slide fifty-seven of how U.S. officials and federal agencies dodge all questions about Israel's nuclear weapons. This clear exhibition of how WPN-136 works. Slide 58, the case of James Doyle, a uh, DOE employee who was fired for stating the truth about Israel's nuclear weapons, the Obama speech at American University. Our polling on nuclear weapons, foreign aid, and other topics. Uh, Page 59, Nixon Library, Finding Aids to National Security Council Files. You can see which ones are too classified to reveal. Uh, erase CIA torture reports and videos. Uh, and all of our cases at irmep.org slash CFP. I'd also like to mention uh, a major conference. It's coming up in Washington. Uh, this is the Israel Lobby and American Policy Conference. Uh, the website for that is israellobbyandamericanpolicy.org. It's March 2, 2018 at the National Press Club. I can't guarantee that this issue will be at the top, but there will be a lot of other really interesting issues. And this has become, in its fifth year, what I proudly uh, pro consider to be one of the most important conferences in Washington about U.S. Middle East policy formulation. And it is a way for voters to get the information they need to become more active, to become more educated about what's going on. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's 8.02. We're two minutes over. Uh, have a wonderful 
rest of the day, and thank you.